work slash, slash events to see where the meetups are. Follow us on Twitter, or works, and we publish those meetups over there so you can actually get an idea of what's coming <coughs> nationally and you know, also internationally where you place our speakers. So today, I'm really uh, happy to have two creators and founders of Apache Flink. The project was upgraded to top level project just recently. And they all here here from Berlin, so give a big hand to Stefan and Um, so, I'm Kostas, you're Stefan, uh, we're both, uh, yeah, co-leaders of Flink. Uh, now, this is, uh, I prepared a probably a highly technical talk. Uh, please do interrupt me at any point with any questions uh, you might have. So Flink, uh, first of all, is German for uh, Swift, Fast, Agile or so, so the, the project shows a, a squirrel uh, as a master group. Was, was this kind of animal. Okay, so what is Flink? Uh, Flink is, is a, it's a pretty fast processing stuff from the API level down to data processing, scheduling, distribution, and so on. Uh, essentially, it offers uh, programming APIs, collection based programming APIs. You see the world uh, as uh, distributed collections of objects and transformations to manipulate these objects. Uh, that work for both uh, batch processing and uh, streaming. So uh, you can accept both like, uh, flat static batch data sources or streaming data sources as they're coming in. Uh, and what is unique about Flink is that these APIs are backed uh, by an execution engine uh, with some unique characteristics that make it very robust. In particular, as I said, the engine has true streaming capabilities, so if you wish batch and streaming APIs are executed using a streaming engine. Uh, it has its own custom memory manager uh, inside the JVM to get rid of many of the problems that you have when you're trying to do very uh, heavy data crunching uh, in Java. Uh, it encapsulates uh, dedicated iteration operators inside the system, so it executes iterative programs as cyclic data flows rather than as uh, unrolled loops. Uh, and it packs this uh, uh, language embedded APIs using a cost based on why, so why would you want to use Flink? Um, and, and why would we have one more about project out there for data processing? Uh, there are a few uh, very unique points. First of all, performance and ease of use. Of course, everybody, uh, you know, everybody is claiming that, and to some extent, everybody's moving in that direction. Uh, compared to an uh, older generation of systems like uh, Mobile Use, it's much easier to write programs. Uh, Flink exploits uh, in memory and in memory streaming, so pipelining, so programs uh, will run much, much faster, and so on and so forth. Um, a second point uh, is uh, unifying paths and uh, streaming workloads. So, when you have cases uh, where you have streaming, you know, some, some data sources are sending in uh, continuous events, some other data sources are in file system, and you want one engine to cover both cases and potentially to combine uh, these data sources. Uh, third, uh, let's say a runtime that just works. Uh, so a lot of a lot of effort in the Flink, in the Flink project uh, has been put to make uh, data processing and memory management uh, in the JVM very reliable. So the system will get you hard guarantees that if that is the memory that you give to the system, the system is not going to exceed that memory and will uh, spill the disk if necessary and when necessary. And it will do that in a very graceful way without experiencing cliffs in performance. So a lot of this stuff uh, was uh, from very early on uh, in the focus of the process. Uh, and finally, uh, let's say predictable execution. So uh, Flink is a very modular system in the sense that it's layered uh, in, a, in a stack as a, as a pie, if you wish. Uh, programs passed uh, through uh, a transformation pipeline and we can get, uh, we can understand uh, what exactly is being executed. You can visualize that and if something fails, you can easily uh, trace it back to the thing. Um, so just to get a, yeah, a very, very brief feel of how it is to program uh, this, uh, this thing, if you have played around with, with other collection-based uh, Maybe as of their like Scala collections or Spark uh, or Scalding or so on, this should look very, very familiar. Uh, you, you're working, this is a Scala API, uh, Flink has, has a Java API, 
uh, that completely, uh, and both of these are completely mirrored. Um, and uh, so by mirrored, I mean that they offer the same, the same functionality. Yeah. Uh, so what you get here is you're defining an object called the uh, execution environment uh, that basically gives you the ability to interact uh, with the outside world. Uh, and using that object, uh, you're reading a uh, file from HDFS, for example, you're applying the flat map uh, transformation, uh, and then you are, uh, so the flat map transformation creates objects of this uh, class, in this case class word, uh, that has two fields, uh, word, which is a string, and frequency, that is an input set. Uh, what, is, what is perhaps uh, a bit different here, I think, is that uh, the, the notion of key value pair, as we knew from other use, is not present at all. So, neither in the API nor in the system runtime. So, the way you are grouping uh, and so on is by just defining keys. Here, we're just defining key, uh, the key by the name of the field, and the system will uh, go down and figure out uh, which one that is. You can also use uh, duples and address them uh, by, uh, by let's say, the name that's of the field. So, field 0, field 1, field 2, and so on. Um, yeah, so we're grouping by, uh, we're summing the frequency uh, field and then we're grouping. Uh, and the last, uh, the last statement environment will execute is exactly the statement that will uh, take this program, build the data flow and send it uh, to the cluster for execution. Um, another example is if you have, uh, let's say that your, your text uh, stream does not come from an HDFS file, but comes from a socket or from somewhere and is coming in continuously. Uh, what you might want to do is a uh, window, uh, define a window on this, um, on this text stream. So for example, here we are defining a window uh, that holds uh, 100, uh, 100 of these elements uh, and it moves every 10 elements. So you can very flexibly uh, define these windows on data stream and then on top of these windows do things like uh, here, grouping by, reduce, um, and so on. Uh, the way we find windows, uh, if you're doing streaming analysis, is the following. So essentially, you need to find something called a trigger policy, which means how often is the computation triggered in this window. In the previous example, it is every uh, 10 elements. Uh, and second, an eviction policy, which is uh, essentially defines uh, how many elements does the window hold. In the previous example, uh, it was 100 elements. You can do that uh, using count-based windows, so based on the number of elements. You can do that using time-based windows, uh, so hold this for 5 seconds or 5 minutes. And you can do that with a mix of both. So you can uh, hold the, the last 5 minutes of data uh, and trigger the computation every 10 elements of the So you can mix and match, you can also define your own windows, and so on. Uh, so this is actually very flexible. Um, I don't want to uh, get into too much uh, detail about, about the API because actually for people that have programmed uh, similar systems, uh, it should be familiar. So you should be able to get, to get started with Flink uh, pretty fast. Uh, just in a nutshell, the usual functional or SQL-like transformations uh, are supported like map, flat map, uh, reduce, uh, reduce group, aggregations, joins, whole group, which is essentially a reduce in, in two dimensions, Cartesian products, uh, and so on. Uh, two perhaps unique uh, transformations in field are the iterate and uh, iterate delta uh, transformations. These and actually have this kind of iterative uh, or loop processing, for example, for machine learning use cases, graph analysis, and so on. Uh, the system is, uh, is designed, so the project is designed to work very well uh, with Hadoop, so it fits uh, in the ecosystem. I'll tell you more about this later. Uh, the, the API that you get uh, when you have a static or a streaming data source is very similar. Uh, so the operators have the same names and so on, the semantics are a bit different because uh, streams uh, never end. Uh, so they're in a little bit of different semantics. For example, joins and streams are always defined over a time-based window. You window both streams in the common window, and then you do the join uh, in there. And as I said, uh, you have window functions, uh, and you can, you get another, a bunch of other uh, goodies in the API, like counters, accumulators, uh, and so on. 
um, as I hinted before, so uh, in general, uh, in this project, it's trying to be very friendly with other systems. Uh, so rather than uh, assuming all the process itself, uh, try to play well uh, with others. So one example of this is Hadoop compatibility. Uh, so you can use all the Hadoop uh, in the output formats. Uh, if you have Hadoop MapReduce jobs, you can actually use uh, the mapper and reduce the code uh, and embed that inside fling functions and actually mix and match uh, Hadoop mappers and reducers uh, with uh, fling transformations. Um, yeah. Any questions so far? It doesn't have it doesn't have the notion of key value pairs. Uh, apart from that, both of these yeah uh, look very very similar. Uh, and to other things, right? To basically, all of these are inspired by link or Scala collections. This kind of collection programming. I think this is a very nice uh, programming abstraction uh, when you're really looking at a distributed computation. Uh, yeah, that is true. Um, so, so why two very similar things? Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, I would say the biggest difference uh, is how these APIs are backed by the execution engines. Uh, so I'm not an expert in Spark, but uh, Spark essentially executes RDBs uh, in a batch way. So you have, a, you have an RDB that is sitting somewhere, you have transformation, you get an RDB, you have transformation, you have an RDB, and so on and so on and so forth. As you will see in this presentation, this is a completely different starting point for executing um, RTD like programs. Okay. Um, let me jump on that. Uh, so, I think. So, one, one comment I want to make is the following. So, Flink uh, has quite a bit of history. So, it started about in 2009. Uh, as, a, as an academic project uh, in Berlin, and, uh, and so Berlin-based universities and other European universities. Uh, it, uh, it used to be called Stratosphere then. Uh, last April it ended, uh, it, it, it went to the Apache Incubator, uh, and this uh, December it graduated, and it's a whole level project. Uh, so there's a lot, actually the, the stack, the, the code behind Flink has a bit of, quite a bit of history. And the technology inside Flink uh, has some uh, is, is pretty unique, uh, and the same, especially Flink is a is a pretty fast stack. So there are a lot of elements inside the system that are inspired by database systems, essentially the way that uh, it manages the memory, uh, the post optimization. A lot of elements from distributed systems like MapReduce, so how do you break uh, down computation into small amounts of tasks uh, to form recovery and so on, and a lot of it uh, from compilers. And uh, basically, uh, just a very side view of how the system works is the following. You take a program, as you wrote it before, uh, and you pass it uh, through a client, uh, let's call it uh, the pre-flight states. Uh, so this is basically something like a compilation procedure. It doesn't have anything to do with, with the programming language compiler. It's a, it's a flink states. And what it does uh, is that it passes the program through a post place optimizer similar to the ones uh, from database systems. Yeah? Uh, it does that for every program, so for Scala programs and Java programs, uh, not only for SQL programs. Another thing it has, uh, another thing it has in the client is, it, is its complete own type of extraction stack that it needs, it needs later to do the data serialization. Uh, the system itself is architected in a master worker partner, so there's a master or a job manager that uh, does a task scheduling, uh, holds another data for recovery, if you and so on. Uh, and the workers that do the actual work are, are also pretty fast stack themselves. So the network stack is a, is a streaming network stack in the sense that it pipelines data, it, it, it follows it can follow a push model rather than uh, writing something out of files or in memory and then some, somebody else pulling it. Uh, the memory manager 
uh, is the component that, so all the memory that Flink gets is, is completely self-managed. It does not rely on, on other people to do this job. Uh, out of core algorithms, all the, all the processing algorithms in Flink, like sorting, hashing, and so on, are implemented using Flink's own memory manager, so they don't create any objects, so these are going to go to memory as well. Uh, and it's own data serialization stuff. So all of this, all of this stuff is based on the premise that all of the intermediate data is kept around not in the form of Java objects, but serialized in the form of binaries. So then you can work on these binaries uh, very, very nicely in other sizes. Uh, you can take them to disk, you can put them up in memory, and see what they the network. And that is the reason that uh, actually uh, there is a type extraction stack to figure out the types and then serialize uh, the data. Good question. Um, the database cost is optimizer. They usually need to know a little bit about the data volume and kind of yeah. And here, do you also look at the data size and something before you do the optimization? We do to an extent. We could do if that information is available. Uh, Can you repeat the question? Sorry? Ah, yes, yes. Uh, so the question was that in databases, uh, optimizers look at the volume of statistics of the data. Uh, what's happening here? Uh, so if this, if this information is available, uh, yes, uh, the optimizer uses that. Uh, if, if this information is not available, the optimizer falls back to heuristics, basically being becoming very, very conservative and using whatever strategy it is the most robust that will not, will not uh, do something crazy. So for example, always uh, repartition join. It will never broadcast something that might be large. Uh, this information is available uh, if uh, you're using one of Flink's input formats, then these input formats are going to go get a sample of the file uh, and, and draw some statistics from that. Uh, there is uh, ongoing work to, uh, to connect the, the optimizer to its catalog and get statistics from there. Uh, but yeah, if, if the, the fallback is very conservative uh, strategies as a heuristic. Okay, so. Uh, I would like to talk about four things plus two things if I have time. These are all basically characteristics of how these APIs are backed <coughs> by a backend that is not a, a straightforward uh, batch backend. The first one is background execution. The second one is exactly how memory is managed. The third one is how iterations uh, are executed. And the fourth one is, uh, is exactly the most basic of the what do I mean by pipeline? Uh, so, usually, uh, especially, yeah, uh, people people assume when they see a program like we saw before that takes a data set, does a few transformations, and it gives out another data set, they assume that the execution uh, is similar to the way you write the program. So, for example, if you have a job here, uh, that is loading some data from a file, putting it in the data set, let's call it a log, uh, and then uh, doing some, some prepping, some filtering of this data. Uh, a common assumption is that this, uh, this job is basically executing states like this. So states first, uh, create a log, put that log somewhere in the cluster, states two, states three, states four, uh, create the <coughs> files. Another way to execute this job, even if it's written from a file and not from a, from a socket, and this of course is unparalleled. Another way to execute this job is, is exactly like that. So take the file and start, start pumping through the data through the operators and just get the results. Right? This is, this is the pipeline execution. Uh, and what is, what is notable about, uh, about this way is that this data set here, we had a variable in our, in our program that was at this name, we declare it as a variable, but actually it never exists during program execution. There's no a single uh, point in time during that execution that this data set is somewhere, and you can grab it. Yeah? Uh, this can actually give you a very, very good uh, performance in many cases. So, uh, if you have jobs that are, for example, creating large and repeated results, for example, they're blowing up uh, the base, the base data, or something much larger, and there are many examples of that. Uh, then, uh, pipelining or streaming the data through the operators uh, can save you a lot in comparison to always materializing every intermediate result. This is number one. 
And the second is that uh, this mode of execution can actually support 